Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Teaching the Odyssey in Translation, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Emily Wilson from the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Andy Mink, and I am the Vice President of Education at the Center. Um, it's always good to uh, see so many of you in the room, including uh, folks who are nearby, like Martha Regalis, uh, just over there in Durham at the School of Science and Math, and Richard Arnold, who has spent some time at the center recently um, working with us on the Troops to Teachers uh, project. It's also nice to see our Los Angeles cohort here as, of, as often as the case, but I'm going to go on record right now as saying that uh, Krista Calkins has the best town name so far. Krista's from Painted Post, New York. Thank you for joining us. I know it's probably been a long day in the classroom for you. Um, we appreciate you taking a break from, uh, from dinner, from your home, or perhaps you're still in your classroom if you're out in the Pacific Coast time. Libby and Mike and I uh, find it very important that we support teacher, teacher leadership and agency. And from my point of view, it really starts with welcoming you to this kind of professional and collegial environment with scholars and experts like uh, Professor Wilson tonight. Uh, the National Humanities Center is in Durham, North Carolina. Um, each day we have a cohort of professors who come to the center and create scholarship in the humanities, create the, the content knowledge. Um, you can always welcome, you're always welcome to come and visit us in person, but you can also go to our uh, website and get a sense of the, um, the breadth and the depth of scholarship that's happening at the center and the various education programs that we uh, do in order to connect that scholarly world with your world in the classroom. Our website has been redesigned uh, recently. I'd invite you to go check it out because one of the most important features in that side navigation pop, uh, panel is the search key. And so what we've done now is index and tag all of the materials uh, that the National Humanities Center has created. And so if you go to that search key tonight, right now, and you typed in Odyssey, you might, for example, find a podcast that we did with Kimberly uh, Jenneron, who is at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And she is a theater um, and drama professor who does a lot with the Odyssey. So we've, again, tagged things so that you can find them and bring them in. And in many cases, find uh, nuggets and chunks of that content that you might use in your own instruction. A couple of quick announcements uh, regarding our webinar series. Uh, we have one webinar right now with open seats, and that's uh, Akram Khadr's session scheduled for April the 21st. Uh, it's titled Understanding the Modern Middle East, which seems particularly relevant right now. Akram was a fellow at the center in 2014 and does a lot of work at NC State um, with, with, with finding ways to change the perceptions and the misperceptions of the Middle East. Right now, we have 45 seats that are available. I just checked it before we went live tonight. I'd invite you to go and sign up for that at any point. If you sign up for Johnny Smith's session on Jackie Robinson and civil rights, that's been rescheduled, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, for April the 28th. And then finally, our last um, session for the spring will be with Carolyn Denard on the life and writings of Tony Morrison. We'll issue a secret VIP registration link at the end of our semester and uh, invite those of you who have attended all of the sessions you've signed up for and uh, spend some time with Carolyn uh, talking about and learning about Tony Morrison. There's some other opportunities at the center that I'd encourage you to consider taking advantage of. That includes live events and institutes like Contested Territory, America's Role in Southeast Asia, 1945 to 1975. This two week session in the summer in July will be available to 36 teachers from around the country. Uh, we'll be using a variety of disciplinary approaches to understanding the complex fabric of uh, the Southeast of Southeast Asia and then positioning America's uh, role in the Vietnam War within that larger context. There is a $2,100 stipend that we'll be issuing to each of our participants and we will be accepting applications until March the 1st. Our online course catalog is currently open for registration as well. That includes five titles that will start on March the 9th, including From the 60s to Now, in which we use music and, um, and various kinds of music history to explore different social and cultural uh, issues in contemporary America. Um, each of these courses comes with 35 professional development hours that translates differently in each of your states, and they run for about five weeks um, each. So please sign up for those if you're interested. 
And then finally, if you are in Southern California, I believe we're still accepting applications for the Education Summit that we're co-hosting at the Huntington Library. Uh, in early March, Mike Libby and myself will be at the Huntington and leading sessions on the use of the humanities uh, to teach civil discourse. We'll also be on hand to talk with you, meet with you, uh, celebrate with you uh, there in Southern California. So we'd love to see many of you who attend these webinars come out and join us live in uh, California. Our Teacher Advisory Council is an important group that works with us to make sure that our work is relevant and applicable to the classroom. Uh, it's really important for me personally that we uh, pay attention to the realities of the classroom and folks like Nate Antiel, who's with us tonight, um, work behind the scenes for an annual, uh, during an annual tenure to really give us a chance to, uh, uh, to create the kinds of programs and the kinds of projects that we feel will be most helpful. I'd love to see uh, some of you who are in many of our webinars apply for next year's cohort. You can expect those applications in uh, March. Finally, I'd like to remind those of you who are new to our webinar series uh, of the importance of you to this conversation. The webinar is an audio only and PowerPoint driven uh, conversation. On the other hand, your participation in that chat box, the one that many of you are using right now to introduce yourself, share where you're from, uh, feel free to talk to each other, feel free to share resources and URLs and ideas for your own classroom. But we'd also like you to use that as a place to ask questions of Professor Wilson. My job as the moderator tonight is to bring those questions into the conversation. I'll, I'll find a, a, the appropriate time to interject myself or to ask for clarification. Uh, so please use that chat box um, uh, as much as you can. Really use it as a way to uh, join this much deeper conversation. So all that's uh, in terms of introduction is really just my way to get to the most important part, which is the introduction of our guest tonight. Uh, professor Emily Wilson is a professor of classics and the chair of the program in uh, Comp Lit and Literary Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Emily, I've just uh, opened up your microphone and I wanna welcome you to our webinar series. Thank you for joining us. And Emily, there Pardon you go. Me, uh, have I switched my microphone on? Yeah, there okay, you good. are. Good. Thank, Thank you for doing so. I, every now and again, somebody, every now and again, uh, any one of these teachers will talk for a while in front of their students before they realize nobody's hearing them. So fortunately, we cut that off quickly. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for joining. I know um, uh, that many of uh, the folks in the room tonight have reached out to me or we've had conversations about uh, the value of learning how to teach uh, Odyssey and really interested in your, your perspective of this. And in a moment, I'm going to give you the uh, the mouse and you can start to advance the slides and lead us through the, the talk. But I do want to actually open with one just kind of personal question, if you don't mind. I'm going to sort of do this yeah, extemporaneously. Yes. And, and I'm wondering if you remember the first time that you interacted with the Odyssey. When, when was the first time? You may not, It may not have been a reading, but it likely was. But when's the first time it was introduced to you when you were a young person? So, I mean, my first encounter with the story was when I was eight years old, when my primary school did a school play version of the Odyssey. Um, I mean, they were they were wonderful, just public school, elementary school teachers, and they got bored of always doing a nativity play every year, so they did they did a version of the Odyssey instead, just to shake things up, and it, it, it was so fun. And that was, I had never sort of heard of Greek myth or an antiquity at all, I didn't know anything. And I got to play the goddess Athena, and of course that was that was really fun i got to you know make my own helmet and i'll talk a little bit about that in a second i have a photo of me me at me, age eight um but of course i didn't actually read the read a translation of the poem at that at age eight and i know i've, I've met eight-year-olds who have read translations of the whole odyssey but i certainly didn't it, it was much much later that i read um read, read actual homer as opposed to kids versions of homer yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to me that something, uh, you know, a, a piece of literature like this is so iconic and, you know, and but at the same time, in some some cases seems inaccessible. And, it you know, it strikes me that you as an eight year old were able to not just witness or participate, but something must have spoken to you. This is your career path. It spoke, I mean, you know, I didn't know then that I was going to be a classicist because I didn't know what a classicist was. But I, but I think on some level, the story of the Odyssey is so simple, right? I mean, it's about being lost. It's about trying to find a home. 
it's about you know are you more are you more lost when you're very far from home in an alternate home can you be someone else when you're away you know and i think you can in a way grapple with those questions no matter what age you are and also just the fact that it has superheroes it is it has you know these divine characters who are vastly more powerful than the mortals and who have this influence over other people's lives either to save or to destroy like superheroes and supervillains which i think is actually very attractive for the little kid um as well as i think the um the in a way the brutality of home i found very attractive as, a, as an adolescent as well that it's um it has a very unsentimental vision of the world where you could die at any moment and you really need to think about what am i going to do with my life if i might be killed soon I'm going to uh, ask our staff, my staff, to go back and edit out those 25 seconds because, wow, what a what a, uh, an elegant way to express the value of the humanities, words that last through generations in time because they're part of, you know, our human themes that we can all share. Thank you for saying so. Yeah. So Thanks. I've given you the mouse and I invite you to now lead us through this story. Sure, yes. Um, so I, I'm going to, have I got the mouse? Now I have the power of the mouse. Wow. You do. Um, <laughs> so now I'm, I'm going to walk through the, this PowerPoint um, with slides. And um, if, the, if the PowerPoint actually works for me, should it work now? It, it should. It should uh, right? Let's see. Let me, let me just double check. Uh, Actually, yes, I'm thinking it, but it doesn't it. work. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, so I did that, but let's just double check. Will you use the arrows on your keyboard? See if that works. In the lower right-hand corner of your keyboard. I'm trying, I've tried go. both and neither one works. Yeah, there you go. I think you just, uh, I think it caught you up with you. So it for me if need be. I mean, I don't, it doesn't really matter who, yeah. who clicks the mouse. Um, I'll, I'll be here on the back. And if you, if I sense that you're trying to advance, I'll go ahead and do it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, could you could you click forward? What do you see right now? So, I am. Um, what I was get, planning to do, if the slides work, was to um, take you through some slides and do something like a lecture talking about my goals in creating a new translation of the Odyssey, which I hope yep, will definitely. implicitly be a way for us to all to talk about um, what it might mean to teach the Odyssey in translation. Professor? I would may, love I, for... Um, yes. Professor, so, I just want to make sure that the slides are working correctly. Um, what do you see on your screen right now? I see a picture of myself, kind of bad picture of me. <laughs> Yeah, so I've advanced the slides and I wonder uh, if somebody else in the audience, what do you see on your screen? I just want to make sure that the internet hasn't slowed something down. You see the cover photo. Yeah, so right now I think Mercedes is seeing the Minoan woman. Um, I think it's the muses are on the screen for us. So uh, Emily, I'm not sure if your screen just isn't quite catching up with it. Huh. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Just give me one second. Be patient, everyone. I'm going to turn mine off and turn it right back on. So now you should have lost that. Okay. Now what do you see? Do you see the muses? I see. No, no, no muses. And I don't think they're muses, but um, I don't see them okay. anyway. Okay. Um, it's funny. Everybody in the audience can see my slides, it looks like. So. That's so uh, weird. Um, I, what it says at the top is now viewing Andy Mink's screen. Yep. So you're, if uh, I'm seeing your screen, then I should see exactly what, and you say that you're seeing the Cretan Blue Ladies. Yes, correct. And again, I just want to double, thank you for doing this, by the way. It just takes a moment. Uh, Maria says that she's seeing the cover photo. Jeremiah, thank you for chiming in. I just want to double check. Uh, can somebody else right now chime in that you can see the cover photo, the picture of the, of the of the three ladies. Everybody else huh. see that? Um, everyone else can. <laughs> well, if it's yeah, only so me that can't see, see them, then I can just look at my other version of my PowerPoint and. You might need to do that because. Uh, should we just do that? Because I don't, I don't want to waste yeah. people's time with me failing to do the PowerPoint. If it's just something wrong with my computer, then 
you know, it, I don't want to. Be, it could be, and you can just tell me. You can just tell me when to advance. Uh, Juliet, of course, uh, comments that all of us as educators what? go through this all the now time. It's suddenly working. For some reason, it's working now. Wait, wonderful. Okay. I now see the blue lady. I think your I think your internet might be a I little can... slow on this. Yes, I think it's. Okay. I think I have a slow connection. Okay, go ahead and uh, try again. Are you with us, Emily? It doesn't do anything for me. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, trying to click the arrows on my computer. It doesn't do anything. But if you just click for me, it doesn't, that's, that'll be all right. Okay, I've got the map of your lecture up on the screen now. Okay, so then I'm just going to talk through um, the map of my lecture. So I'm going to do um, a whole sequence of things that I want to talk about in terms of what I wanted to bring out in creating a new translation of the Odyssey, a poem which obviously has been translated into English many, many times already, which I, I hope will also be a way of talking about what might one want to achieve in, in the classroom in reading this text with students of any age. Um, and I'm going to start, and I hope that I won't just sort of talk solidly for 45 minutes, but that everybody will ask questions, intervene. I, so the, the reason I wanted to have a map of the lecture is that, so that it's clear there are, there are particular topics and you're welcome to, at any and at any point, whether it's at one of these junctures or at other, some other point, stop me and ask or ask any questions about anything that arises from what I'm bringing up. Great. So if we can go on to the first um, slide of the, um, of the, with a photograph of the rocks of Corfu. What I want to do first is read a passage from the translation, which I, I want to do partly just to, to give you a flavor of it if you haven't read it, and also to emphasize, I'm gonna interweave a few readings from the translation into what I say tonight as a way of emphasizing that um, Homer is, the Homeric poems are based on a long oral tradition. And one of the big things that I think is important to get across in this text um, whether we're, whether you're listening to it on audiobook or even if you're reading it as a text, is to be conscious of that oral tradition, which I'm trying to bring out through the use of meter and through a text that I hope is readable out loudable. And the, the passage I'm going to read to start with is from book 13, which obviously might seem like a random number and an unlucky number out of this 24 book poem, um, but in a way it's a very significant endpoint and new beginning because this is the moment when Odysseus actually gets home geographically. Um, and of course, it may be a surprise to students that the homecoming of Odysseus, spoiler alert, it happens when you've still got almost half of the poem still to go, um, which I think is a way of just showing very clearly that coming home is, and what it, what it is to be at home is a whole lot more than being in a particular place. He has, hasn't actually come home, Nostos, homecoming, the journey of homecoming, is not at all complete just by being geographically on Ithaca. There's a whole lot of rebuilding relationships and also slaughtering people that has to happen before he's in any way fully back at home, back to being his old self. So I'm gonna read the passage about Odysseus getting back in the magical self-steering ship, which has been given him by his very kind host, the Phaeacians. And Emily, I, do, I know somebody's asking about the page number, and I don't have, let me search around for my translation because I do not know where the page number is. It's in the middle of book 13, um, if that's helpful. I don't have a copy of my translation with the page numbers on my desk, so it would take me a little while to get the page number. Um, but the middle of book 13, if that helps. Um, should I wait and look for it? I, 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 can, I can find it probably. I think you no, no, just go ahead and read, thank you. Middle, middle of book 13, okay. A sound sweet sleep fell on his eyes like death. He did not stir. As four fine stallions rushed at the whip and raced their chariot across the track, heads high, an easy canter, so was the ship's prow raised. The seething waves of sounding purple sea rushed round the stern as she sped straight ahead. The swiftest bird, a hawk, could never overtake. She sailed so fast and cleaved the waves. She bore a, bore a man whose mind was like the gods, who had endured many heartbreaking losses and the pain of war and shipwreck. Now he slept in peace, 
and he remembered nothing of his pain. So I hope just from hearing a little bit of it, you can get some sense, and maybe even like, students also can get some sense, even if you just do a little bit of reading out loud in the classroom, of the fact that this is a metrical translation of a poem which is in the original metrical all the way through. Um, I, I used the normal meter for anglophone poetry, iambic pentameter, all the way through. The original uses dactylic hexameter all the way through, which is the normal meter for narrative verse in archaic Greece. I did a lot of reading out loud while I was working on this translation. I wanted to honor the clarity of Homer, the quick narrative pace, and to convey these precise, vivid details in describing the material world, even when what's actually happening is obviously really weird. Nobody in archaic Greece or nowadays have actually had a self steering ship that zooms across the waves. But, um, at the moment of being in the passage, you should totally believe this is what it's like. Um, I also think this passage illustrates some of the challenges of both translating Homer and studying Homer, that we have to move from the culture, world, language of Homeric Greek to contemporary English. We have to zoom across these vast distances of space and time. And, and as a translator, I hope that sometimes I can do that with so much smooth and ostensibly effortless energy that the reader is hardly ever thinking about what I'm what I'm doing, how hard I've worked to, to get you there. Um, I also want the reader, and I hope this also is something that one can talk about in the classroom, to have some moments of being aware, this is going very fast. I don't actually know what time I'm in. I don't know if it's now or 3,000 years ago. It's like how Odysseus, after that journey, wakes up on Ithaca, it's his home island, but it seems more strange than any of these strange places he's been to before. It's disguised by fog, he doesn't know where he is. So I want there to be in the experience of reading the Odyssey, some moments of, I don't know if I'm in archaic Greece or in the contemporary world, and maybe I'm actually in both and we're zooming in between them. Um, so I, I just want to give you a little bit of the backstory of how I came to translate the Odyssey. I was asked to consider translating it by Pete Simon, who is an editor, who is an editor at Norton, and I'd worked with him already on the Norton anthology of world literature. So I sort of knew him and, we, and the Norton people were looking for new translations, partly with the goal of new translations that could be, be fit into the anthologies as well as published as standalone texts. Um, I was very excited to consider doing this because as I just said um, in, the, in the initial um, little chat with Andy, I was I first encountered this story when I was eight years old. Maybe we could have the, the next picture, which shows me being eight years old. Yes. Me being eight years old, I'm kneeling down, wearing my wristwatch and my helmet that I made all by myself. I'm playing Athena, and that's the headmaster. We got to gouge out the eye of the headmaster, so that was wonderful. Um, and and of course, like the whole question of who's who's in control. Can you be um, if you're smart enough, can you outwit a god? Or can you outwit a giant? Can you outwit a cyclops or a headmaster? That's something very attractive about that idea in, um, in this text, for, I think for kids and, and teenagers, as well as for grown up people. Yeah, I think the Odyssey is um, a beautifully rich narrative about life questions that I think about all the time, as well as intellectual questions. I mean, like, for instance, now it's 40 years later, I'm not the same person as I was in, in that photo, and yet I also am the same question. And this is a poem which is in a way about that question of, can Odysseus be the same after 20 years? Can you be the same in a totally different context? Or do you need to rebuild all of the context in order to be that same you? Um, it's, a, it's a poem which is about time, identity, uh, communities, how do we form communities? How do we keep people out of communities? What is cultural difference? How much does it matter? Um, what, how does grief affect different people differently? How is rage connected to grief? What is it like for Odysseus to be a veteran? Is he traumatized? Um, and I love, as I said, the way that the poem turns these details of everyday life, like here's the, um, the olive wood stick that they're gouging out the eye of uh, Polyphemus with, here's the boat, here's the bed, here's the tree, these material objects that take on so much meaning in relationships and in human lives. Um, but of course, loving the poem, thinking it's worthwhile to keep on teaching it and reading it and studying it, isn't the same thing as thinking we need another, a different translation. And I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't felt I actually could bring something somewhat different to, um, to the reader's experience and maybe to the classroom experience 
from what I thought was possible in the translation that I myself had used in undergraduate teaching um, up, up until that point. So I did some, some testing of, I did a reading, I read very, very slowly, I reread very slowly in Greek, book nine of the poem, the one with Polyphemus. And then I read something like a dozen translations just of that book to try and figure out whether I felt I could add something different. And then after doing that, I, I figured I, I would, would send the contract and I put the translations away while I tried to do my own, because I wanted to try and do something different from what was already available. Um, so maybe next slide, but I think, think, I think I may have just ruined the next slide, so we might have to go <laughs> to the next slide and yeah. one after. <laughs> um, yes. And then next, the next slide after that. If you're... Okay. Can you see these, uh, Emily? Um, I. Oh yes. Got it. Yes. Yes. So um, I, I just got it. So uh, so aren't there already too many, far too many translations? Um, the. Um, so in the first two hundred years of translating Homer into English, there were less than ten. Everyone was very restrained translations of the Odyssey into English from the time of George Chapman up to the early 19th century. And then in the second 200 years, we've been going at it for 400 years. There's been this huge growth in the, in the Homer translations market and it's rising, there's more and more. Um, so I think it's a real question, like is every translation different from every other translation? Is it different enough that it's worth putting in five years of enormous amount of work? Um, so next slide if you could. Um, so I, for me one of the big questions and one of the big things that motivated me was as I already hinted I very much wanted to create a translation which would speak to the orality of Homer, the clarity of Homer and, and the metricality of Homer. But that regular rhythm that the original has seemed to me an essential feature of my own reading experience of reading the Greek and I wanted to try and do something that would bring out some element of the metricality of Homer and the folk poetry element of it. So the, this is just the first um, two lines of the original. It, go, it goes, Anramoi enne permusa polutropon hosmela polla plante petroiesi rontelietrone persen. So it has, um, Dactylic means from dactyl, which is a finger. If you look at your own finger, you realize you have a long part and two short parts. So that, that rhythm of la 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 goes, runs through the line and it's hexameter as in hexagon. So it's that pattern six times over. There were plenty of translations that just ignore all elements of um, poetic rhythm and just translate it into prose, which of course is, um, is an easy way to do it, but it means that you can't then do any kind of discussion of poetic features of Homer. So can we have the next one? I can't see it, but I'm just guessing it. Yeah, so, so another option is to use um, rhyming couplets, which the first couple of translations, the first few translations into English did. The first one is by the dramatist George Chapman. The man o muse informed that many a way wound with his wisdom to his wish he'd stay, which I think is kind of great, but I also think you can't really use rhyming couplets in contemporary English poetics. And I also think, you know, wisdom isn't actually a good translation of anything in the Greek, it doesn't have anything about wisdom. So there were also norms of translation which were okay in the 17th century. I don't think you could get away with that nowadays. Can we have the next slide? I'm gonna guess you went forward. I don't yes, see that you I did. did. Okay, great. Um, so then another option would be to use um, something like that rhythm within English. Um, the only one I know of that actually does that is the Rodney Merrill translations that go, um, that use hexameter, but with an English stressed meter. So tell me, muse of the man versatile and resourceful who wandered. So it, it scans in a similar way to the way the, the original scans. Another option would be to use long lines, which are not actually hexameters, but might look like that if you don't read them out loud. That seemed to me not quite satisfactory because there's no anglophone tradition of using hexameters. When I've experimented with trying to use hexameters, I feel like it just creates this lumbering line which loses all of the pacing that the original has. Um, so, can you go forward? Yes. 
so then I once I'd once I then narrowed everything down, I, I it was clear to me that I wanted to use iambic pentameter. Um, sorry, I think I skipped a slide that you will probably be looking at. So the most common, the most the best sellers um, before my translation were these um, translations which use the norms of contemporary Anglophone poetics, which means free verse. So it has no regular rhythm, but it's laid out like verse. Um, and I think you can also see if you look at these together, which I hadn't realized until after publishing mine, the degree to which they, each translator is looking back at the ones before. So you can see how we have plundered, 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 time and again, time and again, wanderer, wanderer. So there's a, it seems to me clear that each translator is not just looking at the Greek, but also looking at previous translations um, such, such that um, the choices aren't just being, um, but in a way that there's an illusion of choice in that idea of there are almost 70 translations, but a lot of them are actually quite similar to each other because they're replicating whatever choices the previous translators have made. And so then next slide, I wanted to um, to use iambic pentameter and to try to, to think for myself about whatever I, I thought I could do with the Greek rather than being tempted to look at other translations. Um, I also chose to um, to use the same number of lines as the original. I think, I think that's next slide, if you don't mind. Line for line. Um, yes, yeah. line for line. So I wanted to use the same number of lines as the original because it seemed to me also in looking at translations, not just of Homer, but of other texts too, that especially if you're translating from a very inflected language, meaning a language where there's a lot of possibility for conveying um, the syntactical relationship between words um, by the endings of the words, as opposed to um, we have to do a lot of work in English with prepositions. Um, so there can be a, a great temptation to expand and have the translation end up being half as long again as the original, especially if every translator is aware this word in this language has no exact corresponding word in another language. So you always want to fling down five different things to cover all your bases. And again, you lose the pace. So I wanted to force myself not to do that by keeping to the same number of lines as the original poem. Um, so then another big formal question um, that arises for every um, translator of Homer is what to do about repetition. Um, and I think this is also one of the big issues in the classroom in teaching these poems, both the Iliad and the Odyssey, is how do you make how do you make sure that the students see the repetitive elements of these texts not as something which you're just going to yawn boring but also but that you're going to realize this is part of this really interesting oral tradition this folk poetics um, within a primarily oral culture which is the kind of culture in which the homeric poems emerged the greek-speaking world was totally illiterate for many centuries so poets who were composing out loud like contemporary hip-hop or rap poets. If, if you're rapping, you're not looking at a text and then reading it out. You're composing on the fly. And as you do that, you have to then be able to appeal to particular tropes, particular things that rhyme with particular things. And similarly with the Homeric poems, there are particular formulae that you can plug into a particular line and then you can think ahead. Within an oral culture, repeated things can mean this is a valuable phrase. We have held on to it for many centuries. We value this. Um, Whereas I think in, in a very written, writerly culture like ours, it's a very literate culture, despite the existence of some, some kinds of things like hip hop, um, we have a lot of focus on the written word. And I think that encourages an idea that if you meet a repetition, that's boring, that's cliche, it means the author hasn't bothered to edit, hasn't bothered to go back and come up with a different way to say that. So I think the whole meaning of repetition can be very different for a reader of a contemporary text versus the meaning of repetition in its original context. So I sort of struggled with that, and, and I still struggle with how, how, to do, how to deal with that as a translator and also how to deal with that as a teacher. Um, it seemed to me that as a translator, what I wanted to do was sometimes keep some repetitions. I wanted to give, give the reader some sense that there are um, repeated stable elements, that you're going to have an awareness. The same thing can happen today that happened yesterday. When you go for a feast, when you have somebody welcomed into, um, into, into their house, their home, hospitality tropes, getting dressed tropes, they're going to repeat over and over. 
whereas and, and, and slaves are going to be humbled, wine dark sea is going to be wine dark over and over. But I felt as I experimented that it wasn't always possible to keep quite as many repetitions as the original without it starting to feel dead on the page. So I created some variation within the repeated components. Can I ask um, I think you, I'm getting a question. Uh, yes. Yeah, if we yeah. can ask this question, Jer Jeremiah uh, from Colorado is asking if you could expand just a little bit on this connection you've made between ancient storytellers and orators with modern day rappers and singers. Is there a is there something about the discipline or the writing or the poetry? Is there something about our human ear? What? Why do you think that's that's a consistent uh, approach? Yeah, I mean, I think those, they're actually very different genres. I think the genre of ancient epos or epic is not quite the same as modern rap because, of course, modern rap doesn't usually involve these long set piece narratives. Um, I mean, in oral, all cultures, all storytelling cultures around the world, um, it, I don't think people know of any oral storytelling, oral poetry cultures where it's common to give, to produce poems as long as the Odyssey in one sitting. Usually oral storytellers tell something that might last half an hour or somebody might rap for half an hour. Um, I think it's similar in that they're both um, they're sort of they're potentially text-free um, traditions, and of course, the, in the Greek situation, it's because the Greek-speaking world didn't have reading or writing. So, how do you preserve? How do you create um, poetry? How do you create stories? You do it by creating these traditions of stories, which then can get retold and, ch and gradually change over different generations and in different contexts. Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit different in the modern context because, of course, there is both writing and um, recording and you know there's an internet nowadays um, but I think there's still an idea of um, I mean, in a way there's also comparison one can make of um, oral oral epic was very often experienced in competitive festival cultures right with one poet or one poetry reciter um, facing off against another which I think is quite common well, quite similar in a way to the idea of the the rap face-off or the, the hip-hop challenge of you know one person's going to rap and another person's going to try and do it better. So there's this idea within these, both of these poetic traditions of I'm going to try and one up the way you did those tropes. We're both going to be within the same genre, but I'm going to try and do the same thing much better than you did. That's really fascinating. Um, Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, so maybe we go ahead. Um, so I guess in, maybe I, I had again, I guess I was thinking, so maybe this is also related. I think the, the, I like the rap comparison too, because I think it helps shake up some of the stuff I'm going to talk about next. Um, I think people, maybe especially young people, have an idea of very, very canonical literature, must be very daunting, must be, very, and that's partly because we have this idea um, of canonical literature has to be super um, high class, high brow, difficult in all kinds of ways. There's this tie, tying together of literary difficulty has to go with um, socioeconomic class. And I think it's, it's important just to try and um, consider how can we unpick that tangle of associations, which I think is very anachronistic when we're talking about Homer. And that's one of the big, one of the many big reasons why it could be useful to incorporate some discussion of the Homeric poems into the modern classroom is to try and rethink some of the things we think of as natural. We think of grand, high-class literature. That's got to mean something more like um, Milton's Paradise Lost or Whitman, and it's going to be difficult in certain ways. It's going to be elusive. The Homeric poems aren't really like that. Um, so, can I, can I go forward in the slides? That, um, yes. You may have already gone forward, and I didn't, I didn't know. Oh, sorry. Um, my, 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 the public of apologies for my, for my technology. Maybe it's good if I'm talking about home and my technology is a little bit backward, but that's, that's just how it goes. Um, so I, I, I wanted in general to try and um, echo multiple different elements of um, the, um, the Homeric poems, including their folkloric quality. Yeah, the fact that the I, I, I referred to Milton and Whitman as false examples, and it seems to me that um, we have this idea within um, the translation and also the teaching of the Homeric poems that we're going to bring in these um, these these other ideas, the, these li much later literary traditions. We're going to think of epic that must be grandiose, 
or epic, ancient epic, that must sound archaic, even if that wasn't actually how Homer sounded to anybody in archaic or classical Greece. If, I think it's important just to remember these poems were performed out loud to illiterate audiences and people didn't have footnotes, they didn't have teachers telling them that's what it means. They got the story just from the words. Um, and I think it, it, ideally one wants to convey to students that there can be a deep kind of difficulty, but it doesn't have to be a surface kind of difficulty as well. It doesn't have to be that you pause over, I don't understand any of the vocabulary. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, so I, I, in discussions of my translation and in um, in some of the reviews, I feel like there have been some accounts of it that suggest it's modernizing or it's domesticizing or it's colloquial. It seems to me that those labels can be a useful starting point, but they don't necessarily tell um, the whole of the um, the whole of the truth of what I was trying to go for, at least. Even beyond the fact that most people don't speak iambic pentameter um, most of the time, or even all of the time, even all the time as they do in my translation, I also wanted to create a register that would be similar to everyday speech and that wouldn't necessarily send a high school student or a freshman from college like, to look things up in a dictionary, um, but that would be always actually a little bit odd, it, partly because it's in a regular meter and also because it ha I have a mix of different registers at different points. Homeric Greek is a weird language. It's a language that nobody ever actually spoke because again, it emerges from this oral tradition. It comes from um, different dialects of Greek emerging from different eras in the history of the Greek language. So of course it would be tempting to think I mean, I, I was in fact tempted by the idea I could just do a mixture of different Anglophone dialects and I could have some Chilcerian English and I could have some Cockney and I can have some Ebonics in there and I can have some California English. But, but of course that would be, I think, much more fun for me to write than for anyone to read. And it would also make it impossible to do my other goals of trying to have this immersive, engaged experience for the reader to really care about the characters and to see how each character has a distinct point of view. I think there's some comments. Should I talk about the comments? Um, yeah, and I and I just want to make sure that I'm, I've caught up with you. Right now, I'm displaying a slide with the weird words. Yes, that's good. Yes. That's okay, fine. great. Fantastic. Yes. yes. Yeah, if you want to comment so, on it. Yes. I mean, I want, so weird words, I want to flag that it, sometimes people say, I found that word. Okay, they pick out what single word and say, I found that a little surprising or jarring or something. I wanted to, to have there to be some the reader sometimes to be woken up about the translator created some choices. Not every word is entirely predictable. Um, so that somebody saying word choices in translations have been a great topic of discussion. Um, I think that I think it would be possible, um, no matter whether you know any Greek or not, or if, if you're teaching a text from that's translated from any language, I always find it a useful and really interesting pedagogical exercise to do in a way a comparable thing to what I just did at the start of juxtaposing the first few lines of the Odyssey in several different translations. And you can then, in a way, it's an invitation to close reading, because I think students at a, at a very early stage of literary studies tend to think it's all about the content. I'm just going to get to the content. I got the story, I got the characters, I know the plot, I can sum up the spark notes, I'm done. Whereas if you give them, you know, 10 different texts which all, in which the content is all exactly the same, then you actually have to drill down into how does word choice matter? which I think is actually what any um, literary teacher is going to want to, to, to have students engage with on some level. It's going to be at least one of the things you'll want to engage with. And so whether, whether or not you have the lab or you have my translation as one of the translations, I think it's really useful to have several different translations. And of course, you can't make that the only thing you do in the classroom, but it, it can be one class session you could spend on that. Okay, so we, can we go forward? Yes, we're on equivalence. Um, equivalence, yes. So the whole thought question of, of equivalence. Um, I don't know, and I, I'm assuming that you guys teach a whole range of different students from different kinds of backgrounds. Some of them may be um, bilingual or multilingual. I think it'd be really useful to be able to activate some of the experience of bilingual or you know, students who've taken even a little bit of some other language in school, just to try and help them to um, validate the idea that there isn't actually an easy way to say this is exactly the same thing in one language versus another language. 
Um, can we go forward? Um, yes. So yes. So I mean, get, just introducing students to that fact that there actually isn't exact equivalence, I think, is an extremely important thing and may may be very very difficult for students to take on to grapple with, but may potentially be really interesting. Um, so translation theorists, and I don't I don't mean to say that every high school teacher should necessarily teach translation theory, but I'm just going to give you a little tiny bit about that. Um, translation theorists like Antoine Berman and Lawrence Benuti um, have echoed the um, German theologian Schliemacher, so this is a common trope in um, translation theory studies, arguing that translators can have an ethical obligation towards the foreign, towards foreignizing and trying to bring elements of, of foreignness into Anglophone, because we, of course, English is a hegemonic language around the globe. English tends to be the colonizing language as opposed to all these other languages. And in most, most non-English English publishing markets, translated literature plays a huge amount more of a place in the canon than it does in English. So then I think there's a question about then how do you teach translated literature? How do you translate given those um, particular pressures? Um, so there's this argument that um, some kind of foreignization in terms of translation is the only way to pay due respect to alien cultures rather than making everybody speak English. So this is equivalence of, are you going to force everyone to learn the correct language English, the dominating language English? Are you going to make all translations sound as if they were always originally composed in English? Is there something problematic about that? And can we go forward? Um, so um, I think there's definitely something problematic about the blindness of Anglophone cultures to literature in translation. I think this is another argument for why should the humanities classroom include texts like the Odyssey? One reason is the Odyssey is not, not English literature. It's a text from a totally different culture, a totally different language. It's, it's exposing you, even if you're not aware of that, it's, it's exposing you to this totally different culture. Um, I, I think that the solution to this ethical dilemma of how do we how do we welcome the foreign into our culture isn't always to translate or present all texts with an emphasis on this is different. And in, within the classroom, I, don't, I think that one has to convey both this is different and also this is the same, this is relatable. You can understand this. This is about families, this is about home, this is about community, this is about xenophobia, this is about violence these things we can understand even if we don't know all the details of how this culture plays those things out i think in in terms of the details of my work um if i translate always to make it as difficult as possible because i'm going to echo greek syntax and i'm going to make all the idioms sound unidiomatic because the idioms are always going to be different that seems like an easy way to pe make people even more bored by or um, read even less translated literature than they already do and it's already a really small amount of um, of the canon. Um, so I guess I sh the next slide. Um, yes. So there's also We're this common argument in translation, translation studies that translation should be made more visible as a process, that we shouldn't perpetuate the fiction that you're actually getting the words of Homer when you read my translation of the Odyssey. So I think it's a real question, how do you activate that awareness in the classroom? I'm also conscious of thinking about how do I activate that awareness for readers who might not be using my translation in the classroom. I, I wanted to create a translation that would invite students to feel engaged and would realize that a human being had created it, that I'd made particular choices. Um, it seems to me that in the case of contemporary novels translated from other world la languages into English, there is an expectation among American, North American and British readers of this fluent style, like, people aren't always going on are, are not going to likely think i read a translation of the girl with the dragon tattoo you're probably going to think i just read that and it was kind of boring whereas if you're reading a translation of an ultra canonical ancient text i think you have very different expectations about what the style quote unquote should be we expect ancient epic to sound ancient so we think it's going to sound archaic even if the original doesn't really sound like that it, in fact, the original doesn't sound particularly Elizabethan, but, whereas, of course, that's the way you signal it's oldie if you're writing English. Um, and we also expect it to sound epic. Um, so uh, that means we expect it to sound melodramatic and bombastic. 
And I think if you can look, if you look at different translations of Homer, you can see how most of them fall into one or other of those preconceptions. It's going to sound either archaic or it's going to sound bombastic or maybe some mix of the two. Um, I don't think those are totally invalid interpretations. It's not like, of course, Homer is ancient. Of course, it is an epic. Um, but I also think those are, those are not the only possible things to emphasize. You can also emphasize, as I was doing earlier, this is very clear syntactically. This is folk poetry. It seems to me that insofar as there's difficulty in the Homeric poems, it's difficulty on a human, ethical, social level. It's not difficulty on the level of, I don't get what that sentence meant. Um, I think in, in the case of ancient epic, in contrast to translations of contemporary literature, we need to think differently about how to relate to the source text and how to make um, the work of translation visible. Um, so next slide. Yep, I'm on the um, Heracles at the Crossroads. Yes, so this is Heracles at the Crossroads. Um, this is I'm using this as, as the wrong image for translation. I think we tend to, and I'm sure this will, will come up in the classroom if you ever have a conversation about translation. I think very, very many students have some preconception that goes with this idea that there's a binary choice. Either you choose pleasure, look how, how lovely she is with almost no clothes on, she's lying there, and that's the, the pleasurable but wrong, false, untruthful choice. Or you take the hike up the mountain with um, virtue, that's the right choice, but it's going to be almost unreadable. And so I think a lot of people have this idea that there's the literal um, virtuous translation, which is somehow more truthful, or there's the fun poetic translation, which and, the, and there's something somehow vicious about that. Whereas, in fact, I don't think that's a very <laughs> good way of approaching either the, the study of the humanities in general or the study of literary texts in particular. Can we go forward? Um, this is, if, if we've got forward, this is um, Cindy Sherman, the um, yes, the contemporary artist, and of course these are all self-portraits of, um, they're all the same artist, depicting the same artist, but they're all, they're all different, and of course she does many, many other self-portraits. So my, my point when showing you that is to suggest that there are many possible ways to read the Odyssey, there are many possible ways to translate the Odyssey. I wanted to create a translation that would itself be open to different interpretations and that would offer a different portrait of Homer from the ones that were there in previous translations. Um, so next slide, please. So I, one of the things that I, I uh, have been aware of in teaching the Odyssey is that there's a tendency to um, to assume that it's a sort of um, old school comic book superhero story, which I'm sort of illustrating by giving you these comic book superhero versions of the Odyssey. Um, it, but it's, I, it, it's very often imagined to be a story about the unproblematically heroic male Western hero, implicitly white, who is good because he crushes bad guys, monsters, foreigners, which he women, understands the value of hospitality, you write that down, you get the A on the exam, gets back with that, the guy gets back with the objectified wife, regains all his wealth, all his slaves, nice a celebration of family values, consumerism, patriarchy, war, superiority of normal male pe white people over foreigners and women. So I wanted to grapple with that, and I, I was very conscious of that reading as one that I think is an enormous oversimplification of the original poem that I felt was actually enabled by some translations that I'd used, as well as by potentially by teaching practices that might encourage, I think as a teacher, one can encourage a either more or less critical response to the, the text. It seems to me that the, that the Odyssey is a very, very layered and complex um, poem which is complex about its own core values and about its own points of view. It has more than one point of view. It isn't always focused or focalized through Odysseus's perspective. Can we go to the next slide? Yes, now we're on point six. So and the, I, I should also remind so you we have about, about a half an hour. Okay, so I, I mean, I will speed up a little bit if I can. So I, I feel like I'm going a little slowly, I'm sorry. So Nostos and Xenia are crucial Greek um, texts which are central in the poem. Can we go forward? Um, Nostos, from which we get nostalgia, 
is um, the term for a poem about a journey of homecoming. A, a home, homecoming is a word that comes up constantly in the Odyssey, especially in the context of all the people who lose their nostos, who don't have a journey home. So what I don't want to emphasize is that this central concept, um, this is not, um, it's not that it's telling this simple story of Odysseus comes home happy ending. Right from the start, from the first 10 lines of the poem, we're shown that this is about one person getting home and all the other people not getting home. Of, of those 12 boats full of men, no, everybody dies except for one person. Um, Nostos is not achieved by almost everybody else. And what home means, how, how homecoming happens, um, is really difficult for almost everybody except for Odysseus. Similarly, the concept of xenia, from which we get xenophobia and the less, less sadly less common xenophilia, is this, in a way, inspiring ideal about um, networking between people and how you can form these bonds so you don't necessarily, when you meet some, a man from a different kinship network, you don't always have to slaughter each other if you can exchange gifts, go to each other's house, um, become best buddies. Um, but of course, it's also represented and problematized in the poem as a network that doesn't always work. If Odysseus goes into the Cyclops' home without asking, bad things happen. Zinnia was violated. If the suitors go into Odysseus' home without asking, the same bad things happen, which is the host slaughtering the guests. Um, so I think the, the original poem is compelling because of how deeply it lets us inside the perspectives of so many different characters. Um, and I think this diversity of perspectives and the social and emotional complexity can be obscured in translation. So one thing I want to flag is that I used in my translation the word slave a lot more often than I think any other English translation has done, um, which I think is to do with a similar set of issues as the issues about using bombastic or grand or archaic language. It distances you and it also creates a sort of ethical distance. We want to think of Odysseus as the good guy. So we don't want to grapple with the fact he's also represented as a slave owner, as, as an enslaver. Um, and I think we actually have to grapple with that. I think in approaching this text within our own context, within our own awareness of the ethical horror of slavery, I think it, it's actually something that's really important to talk about in the classroom is how does this text deal with slavery and how, to what extent do we get the perspectives of enslaved people who presumably would also have been or could also have been part of the audiences for the Homeric poems. Can we go forward? Yes, seven types of yes. complications. Types of complication, yes. So can we go forward again? Yes. So um, I just want to give you that the, the beginning of my translation. I'm just going to read it and um, just think about the word complicated. Tell me about a complicated man. Muse, tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had wrecked the holy town of Troy. And where he went and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea and how he worked to save his life and bring his men back home. He failed and for their own mistakes they died. They ate the sun god's cattle and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. And can we go forward? Um, so I was interested in general in trying to bring out the expansive, imaginative and ethical vision by which the Odyssey allows us to feel for Odysseus himself in all his complexity but also for all those he visits, befriends, mutilates, enslaves, marries, checks up with, kills or lets die, and the ones who don't have a journey home, who are really at the center of that passage. Um, so I just wanted to give you also a, a sense of how complicated the process of translation is. And in choosing the word complicated for polytropos, I wanted the reader to be, to be conscious of the fact that this poem might be told in relatively simple language, but it's on some other level extremely complicated. There's a complexity to the narrative form that we're not starting in an expected place. The whole, the beginning and end are, are surprising. The way the narrative meanders is surprising. And the, there's a turniness, a twistedness about the poem itself as well as about its protagonist. Um, so I'm, just, I'm can we go forward, I think? Sorry. Point of view. Um, in publishing my translation, I have looked at a few passages of mine next to other translations, and that exercise has made me even more aware of what a world of difference um, can lie in the details of word choice. So this is another plug for do definitely, I would say, consider doing some version of this in the classroom. I created some Twitter threads which um, 
which includes some going through of different translations next to little bits of mine, just trying to figure out how, how does even looking at two lines show you how there can be a different interpretation. Um, so for instance, it seems to me that many translations make Calypso, the goddess with whom Odysseus spends seven years, seem like a hysterical nymph, because we have the word nymph in English, it's a false friend, a nymph in, in ancient Greek doesn't mean nymphomaniac. Um, so, and similarly, I think the, the way translations very often import things like monster or savage into the depiction of Polyphemus, I think is actually quite different from what the original is doing with that character. So I wanted to spend just a minute looking at the, I, I said that I think the slave characters are very important and important to talk about. So look, looking at the hanging of the enslaved women by Telemachus in book 22 of the poem, which I think is a, is a passage which students may well want to talk about and, sh and should be encouraged to talk about. I think it might well take some trigger warnings because it's of course a very um, disturbing passage about gendered violence. Um, and they are also, you might, you might me want to do a you know, spoiler alert, yes, Odysseus does get home. Um, yes, he manages to kill the suitors who've been harassing poor Penelope. So I just wanted to, to walk you through, um, we can go relatively quickly through the next few slides. I'm just gonna, so next one, please. I'm assuming that most people have, won't necessarily um, yeah. read now the Yeah, now we're on, what is the, what is the murderer slide? like? Yeah, what's the murderer like? So, I mean, I, I, what my, one of my big things that I want to suggest is just have people engage, have students in the classroom engage with questions about narrative point of view, um, focalization, how is the narrative focused? That might be different in one translation versus another. Seems to me that if you if a translation presents Telemachus as thoughtful or stern right before he hangs 12 women, we have a very different idea about what the narrator thinks versus if we think um, I used um, Telemachus took initiative, he's got some kind of idea. It might not be a good idea in what he's about to do. Can we go ahead? Yes, are the so victims then, here? Um, Telemachus Yes. Telemachus has three lines when he explains what he's about to do as he's about to um, string up the 12 women by the neck until they're dead. Um, he, in several translations, uses gendered abusive language against them, which seems to me to suggest this interpretation which says they are criminals It's because they've done something sexually abhorrent, that's why I'm going to kill them. That isn't how I read the Greek. I think what the Greek, to me, what the Greek seems to be saying is the presence of these enslaved people who've been claimed and raped by other men dishonors me, dishonors my father, and makes my whole ownership of this house, my, my father's ownership of this house, problematic. So it's an honor killing rather than a punishment for a crime. But I think just noticing, if you look at different translations, there are some translations, of course, all of these are by men, that do use words like creatures, trolls, sluts, whores for these women which suggests that we um, were supposed to somehow endorse the idea that they do deserve to die. Can we go ahead? Yes. Um, so then we have this great simile. I think in general, talking with students in, in some depth, one could do some close reading of particular similes. And that's a small enough, usually a small enough amount of text that you can, you can really tease quite a lot out um, in the classroom, finding multiple different points of comparison between the simile and what's happening in the, the narrative around the simile. In this passage, we have the hanging of the women as compared to the hanging of birds who in ancient Greece were commonly caught in nets while birds were caught in nets and then eaten. Um, I think a lot of the translations I've looked at tend to interpret the simile as if it's a dehumanizing move. It means the women are just like birds, so we don't need to worry, it's just like killing chickens. Whereas it seems to me that one can also read the simile as offering their perspective. They, like the birds, want to go home. They wanted a nostos. They didn't get that. Instead, they got hanged. Um, next slide. Final thing is that the final terrible detail of the women's feet, I think in a couple of the translations, it seems as if, again, this is this, I think, potentially modern idea about party girls, this is what happens to them. Um, we're going to blame the victims of rape by um, saying they're dancing even in death. Maybe they wanted it, maybe they're gagging for it, which I, again, I don't think is a necessary feature of Greek. So final, ne next slide. So just summing up what I, want, what I wanted to say about book 22 in, in particular, 
but this applies to the whole poem, I think one can always see several different points of view within the different characters. As a translator, I was very much concerned with how can I make sure the different voices of the characters feel different, that when I read them out loud, I want to feel I can hear a different character. It could be, I could be putting on, having up a different voice. Um, I want to bring out how the motives for the killing, the motives for the homecoming, the motives for what people do, or people, goddesses, gods, whoever it is, it's different. Um, so I'm just gonna read my version of that passage. Telemachus then took initiative, insisting, I refuse to grant these gods a clean death since they poured down shame on me and mother when they lay beside the suitors. At that they actually wound a piece of sailor's rope round the rotunda and round the mighty pillar, stretched up so high no foot could touch the ground. As doves or thrushes spread their wings to fly home to their nests, but someone set a trap, they crashed into a net, a bitter bedtime. Just so the girls, their heads all in a row, were strung up with a noose around their necks. To make their death an agony, they gasped, feet twitching for a while, but not for long. Okay, so I thought I should um, maybe move to a happier passage for a, for a minute, because of course that's a very disturbing passage, and I, and I wanted to make it as disturbing as possible. Um, so um, the happy ending of the Odyssey, which many ancient readers seem to have thought should have been the real ending of the of the um, of the um, the poem is the final reunion of Odysseus and Penelope over the bed. Should I pause and talk about birds? Um, birds is an you image can, of freedom. Sorry, please. Yes. 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 So I, I mean, I, I agree. They are they are an image of freedom. They they lose their freedom of speech. I mean, I also think that it's um, that it's connected to a whole system of imagery in the poem about the dangers of female mouths to um, male warriors. That of course it's echoing the sequence in the wanderings of Odysseus, where Odysseus is assailed not just by one, but multiple different divine female mouths. There's the mouth of, of Circe, which could enchant, it could enchant him, but he's safe. There's the mouths of the Sirens. There's the six mouths of Scylla, which can eat them up. There's the whirlpool Charybdis, who's all mouths. Um, there's a great article on the ways that the killing of the 12 enslaved women is, a, is in a way sort of cutting off the possibility or tying up the possibility of Penelope could marry someone else. So they're in a way standing in for this would happen if she, if, if Penelope were claimed by a suitor, then we're going to tie up the, the part, the part of the women owned by Odysseus that are that they're dead. So we can move on to now Penelope is entirely Odysseus's. So I think on the level of metaphor, that's also part of what's going on. I think it's a very rich set. I mean, it, it's a, both a horrible and a lot to say about it um, scene. And also just the fact that he chooses hanging versus um, masculine slashing with swords. Um, so I was just wanted to talk for a second about the um, reunion of Odysseus and Penelope. It seems to me that there's, there's very often a tendency to, I, th I think in a way, sentimentalize it to see it as a 100% happy ending. Here they are back together again. Um, it's a Disney sunset kiss and it's so lovely. I think that the, the scene of the reunion is like that scene that I just talked about, one where there's more than one point of view. We have the gaze of Penelope, the gaze of, of Odysseus. Those are actually very different. Um, we, I think you can notice uh, if you read the text carefully, and that would be, this is the case in translation as well as in the original, for instance, just that Odysseus uses I, 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 I over and over again. I made the bed, my bed. He's constantly using the first person singular, whereas Penelope uses in the Greek the dual. And of course, we don't have a dual in English, but she's saying, we, we could have had this life together. We didn't have that. You went away. This is what the bed means to me. It means my tears. So the, the, their vision of their marriage, what, their, what the bed means, what this article of furniture means, is extremely different for each, pe each person. I'm actually not going to read that passage because I think I should make sure that I have enough time for people to ask questions. So what I want to do instead is um, go through the rest of my slides because I wanted to have yeah. um, have you guys have have a chance to engage with this question of um, the reception of my translation. Um, whereas I was working on it, and I, I didn't really think very much about me being a woman and what is my identity as a cisgender woman. Am I somehow always going to be having that? Am I going to be thinking I'm sitting down at my desk being a woman now? I didn't actually think that. 
Um, but I, so I was somewhat surprised to realize how much of the media coverage um, focused on my gender identity. Um, and I think there were, there were, that's a complicated issue, and I think it's one that um, students might well want to talk about, and I think it's a good thing to talk about. Um, maybe we could go through the slides um, forward. Yes. Yep. I've got the, uh, the article from New York yep. Times. Yeah, so can you go through the, through the articles fast? What I want to flag as, as sure. these go, go by is just that they all have the word woman in the title. Woman, 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 women. Could a woman's odyssey, could a woman have been, could the odyssey have been the word for a woman? No, I don't think so, but because I'm a woman, that has to be the, the title of an article about me. Um, I was very pleased by the very few um, pieces that didn't have the word woman in the, in the title because it seemed as if for a while it seemed as if absolutely everyone was going to say just look she's a woman wow tokenism yay um so i think i think there's there are pros and cons to this i think on some level can we have the shira princess of power slide um yes, so i think on some level this is a good right? <laughs> um so princess of power it's great i mean it's great i think if in general people of every age can be encouraged to think you can engage with the humanities, you can be a translator, you can be a classicist, no, ma no matter what your gender identity is, whether you're a man, woman, or non-binary, whatever you are, you can do these things and you can translate epics, you can do big things. Um, we don't have to have the image of the classicist or the translator or the writer or the epic poet as the old man with the white beard. I also think it's very important to have an awareness, which I think is also part of what the coverage did get across, that Translation is an interpretive activity, like almost everything in the humanities, whether you're a journalist or a historian, you're always, the questions you want to ask are going to be shaped by your own cultural and social background. So there's a whole lot of things that go into what shapes the questions I ask about the Odyssey, which include, uh, as you'll probably have, have guessed, the fact that I'm British as well as that I'm I, as well as all the many books that are, books about Homer, but also books that are not about Homer that I've read, as well as the um, the woman thing. Um, the woman, I think the woman piece is just a part of my whole identity, as it is for for everybody. I don't think I don't see gender as my primary identity. So I just want to say four quick caveats about the whole woman thing. Which so somebody's saying I was quite upset by the articles focused on gender. I mean. Uh, there were articles about me, so I, I guess on some level I should be grateful, but I think we need to just see how there could be a problematic element to this. I think people sort of thought of that, of those articles as, this is a feminist gesture, I'm not sure it's feminist. There's, on one level, there's this idea that you just need one girl in the whole village. So I'm supposed to represent all women would respond to the Odyssey in exactly the way that I do, which of course is really problematic. Um, and not least because, in fact, there are many great Homer um, scholars, uh, scholars who are um, who are women who, with whom I disagree. I, I don't actually have the same vision of the Odyssey that every other female Homerist does. So it also implies that I'm the only female classicist in the universe, which of course is not true. I don't like I don't like the idea that other women are being erased by this. Um, second, um, I think there's there's again something really problematic about the idea that. A woman is always going to be predetermined. Everything she does will be predetermined by being a woman, whereas a man can just be normal and um, he won't. His identity won't actually predetermine everything he does in terms of his work. And then a related point is that in fact men do have gender. I've read a few. Um, it, so this is slide number three on that. I've read a We're few um, interviews with other translators of Homer. Um, such as Robert Fagels, Robert Fitzgerald, Stanley Lombardo, and no interviewer ever asked them, so how does being a man affect you as a translator of Homer? Um, you must really identify with the male characters. It, and of course, I'm kidding, but I actually think it might be kind of great if we did start asking male writers and male translators um, to think about that and stop just asking that question to women. In fact, stop, well, stop asking women that more or less you know, for, for the next 200 years. Until, you're, until, we're, you know, until we've had enough of it. Um, and then, so final point is, uh, number four, is that I think all of this is really missing the big headline, which, which is why is it that almost all modern translations, not just of Homer, but of almost every greco roman ancient literary text, why are almost all those translations by white men? Um, I think this, I, this idea that there's something special about me is sort of missing the story, which is why is this field so male-dominated? 
which is in a way that's not the case for the humanities in general, for sure, certainly isn't the case for um, classics in general anymore. Um, so I think this is, is something really problematic about this particular field, and that should be interrogated rather than ask me yet again about, <laughs> about why I'm a woman. Um, so if people want to ask questions about that, they certainly could. I mean, I guess my final thing would just be to, to flag the fact that I have translated other texts as well as the Odyssey, and right now I am translating the Iliad, and I'm, I've, also, I've also done a few other, other texts. And I wanted just to flag that I don't want all of my texts, all my translations to sound exactly the same. I want them all to sound different. So I'm working on trying to make sure that the whole feel and mood of the Iliad is not the same as the mood of the Odyssey. I'm just going to read the first like, seven lines of my Iliad translation, and then I'm hoping that people will have a couple more questions. So this is the beginning yes. of the Iliad. Goddess. Yes. Sing of the cataclysmic wrath of Peleus his son Achilles, cause of so much suffering for the Greeks, that sent many strong souls to Hades, making men a feast for birds and prey for dogs. The plan of Zeus was moving to its end, beginning when those two argued first, Lord Agamemnon and glorious Achilles. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and hope that people have more questions. So I would love to hear what people think. Um, I see that there's um, somebody commented as a combat veteran. I see so many themes that still play and are relevant in today's wartime society. I absolutely agree with that. I think just presenting this poem as a, as a story about a return from war is really, really important and a way to make it speak to this really profound um, experience, which is experienced by modern veterans as well as by archaic Greek veterans. I did a sort of dramatic version of the Odyssey that was uh, done as a theatre thing in New York last year, and, and the actors were veterans. And just watching a veteran playing Odysseus made the, that whole that character come to life for me in a very different way than the way I'd. Than, than even, even though, of course, I've been living with this text for the last forty years, but it came to life for me in a different way seeing seeing a veteran being Odysseus. Um, I would yeah, a, love to hear any really other Andy, Do you want yeah. to? There's a question from Nate and Teal. How do you interpret the uh, the prophecy near the end of the text about Odysseus venturing abroad to where his oar may be mistaken for a uh, winnowing fan? Yes, so that, that's such a fascinating um, thing, isn't it? So that's the prophecy of Tiresias, which we get first in the Book of the Dead, the Nequia, Book 11, and then also it, it gets picked up again at the end. Um, well, I think it, it's clearly about the anger of Poseidon and about whether Odysseus can ever escape the sea. Can he ever escape from the rage that rage against him that Poseidon has from the fact that he blinded his son, the Cyclops? And, and there's this idea of he can never escape that until he gets to somewhere, which is, of course, unimaginable in the um, archipelago land of Greece, that the that people have no knowledge of the sea whatsoever. They don't know what salt is. They don't know what a, they don't know what an ore is. Um, so I think it's a way of problematizing the ending of saying, you know, of sort of asking us, is there ever going to be a, a way, a time when this character is redeemed, or a time when this character will get away from the endless journeys that seem to be sort of part of who he is. So I think it's also a way of talking about. What is the final homecoming? Maybe getting back to the question I was raising at the start of getting back to Ithaca isn't enough. Where is there ever a, an ending? Is he ever going to meet that that country? It seems like the country where nobody knows what an ore is would be even more far away, even more alien than the land of the dead, of the, of the ocean. So Let, yes. let's go ahead and let's go ahead and take Nate's follow-up question, and then we'll move up to Erica. Nate uh, is also curious about how. You, uh, what do you think of the translations that aren't literal translations? Um, do you find Dante's Ulysses to be justified by Homer's text, or do you think it wholly to be an invention? I, I mean, I, I love Dante. Had Dante hadn't read Homer, so it certainly isn't. I mean, it's not like Ho that Dante was thinking, "Let me be truthful to the Odyssey," because he hadn't read it. Um, I think it's a, it's it's a wonderful depiction, and it's so inspiring, and it has inspired so many later. Um, readings of that character may be related to this question of is Odysseus either the constant wanderer or is he as he is in Dante the, the false counselor, the one who's leading his men astray and you know, in a way I think Dante is very truthful even though he hadn't read it to that 
theme that I was I was emphasizing and was there in the first few lines of Odysseus is the leader um, who lets all his men end up dead. What kind of leader is that? Is that because he's silver tongued but actually always out for himself? This sort of ethical question, which is there in the original, which is then also two sided in the original, and is, is also there in the Dante, right? That he's that the Dante Ulysses is both obviously evil, there he is down in the, in the eighth circle of hell, but he's so inspiring and we kind of want to go there too, even though we kind of know we shouldn't. Um, Fantastic, so, thank you. Okay. Yes, so if I were to retranslate, yes, I'm constantly wanting to tinker. I mean, if I'd, I had five years to do the Odyssey, if I'd had 20 years, I would have used every single second. Um, I have, um, I've, I've made a few little trans changes um, in the course of going from the hardback to the paperback. Um, whenever the publisher lets me do a tiny bit of tinkering, I do. Um, I tried to do a radical rewrite at the beginning because I either had other thoughts about how I wanted to do it, but they, <laughs> the editor said, no, you can't change it too much. Um, yeah, so yes, I mean, I, I can, I, right now, I, if they let me, for whatever the next edition is, I probably will make a few more small tinkerings. Um, I mean, I can imagine if I thought I was going to live to a, a maybe 500 or 1,000 years old, I would probably do something like what I was saying jokingly earlier of, wouldn't it be fun to do a multi-dialect English translation and use a long line and use multiple different English dialects? But I don't think, given that I probably won't live to be 1,000, I don't think I should do that. I think I should move on to other things. Thank um, you. Okay, so other names, right? What decisions came into play with names? A long discussion about different letters to create names. Um, yes, that's a good question. I mean, I thought, so my, my thinking was, um, I'm not trying to make things too difficult and I'm not aiming for sort of false foreignization so that it's going to look like Greek even though it's not actually Greek. So I decided I'm not going to do, I mean, some people sort of transliterate in such a way that if it has a kappa in the original, it's going to be K in English, which sort of gives it, a, it gives the whole text a different feel. Um, I didn't want to do that because it seemed to me that in a way that's sort of a fake claim to authenticity, which, and I didn't want to be making fake claims to authenticity. So I used Romanized names, like Latinized names throughout as a way of um, like hoping that that's going to make it seem in a way more familiar. It's, there's going to be a kind of accessibility and I'm not going to make things too complicated for the English reader. I also have a glossary and I did on my website a little bit of like reading out loud of the names. But I know that for classroom discussions, one thing that really often throws students off is I can't talk about Telemachus because I don't know how to say the name. So I did some like, I think, I think teachers can also do this. So let's go over the names and let's make sure we're all comfortable with how do we say Telemachus and we don't need to agonize about it. We can just talk about him. Um, somebody else asked something, right? So a couple of other questions. So much of the Odyssey is direct discourse. Um, so I guess the direct discourse, I absolutely agree. And I'd, my, the translations I'd done before the Odyssey were drama. And I was very much thinking, as I was also already suggesting, in terms of, I want each voice to sound different. I want it to feel like, in a way, there's a proto-dramatic quality to this. I want it to feel like when Telemachus is talking, it doesn't feel the same as when Penelope is talking. Each character has a particular voice. And I, I, I know how I want to perform them out loud. Other, other people could perform it differently, which is fine. But I want to, want to have a sense of this is how the, that voice feels on the page. Um, fourth, fifth century Romans. Um, yes. Um, so, yes, lots of people, I mean, not just Romans, um, also you know, Greeks and many people, and the whole way that um, in late antiquity, there were a lot of allegorizing interpretations of, um, of the Iliad and the Odyssey, because of course they were canonical texts, but then how do we integrate the, these canonical texts with our own ideas about theology, which don't seem to match at all with these pagan gods. So that must mean that we're going to have to um, use the idea of, um, Athena is going to be the representative of wisdom, which is influencing the human soul, and the human soul is on its journey towards heaven. It's not really literally about, it might seem like it's about some murderous archaic warrior going back and slaughtering lots of people, but in fact, it's about the journey of the soul. Um, I think it's, it's super interesting, and it's super interesting also just to show 
I mean, even if you share with students just a little bit of the history of perception of the Odyssey, whether it includes some of the um, late antique or medieval interpretation or any modern interpretation, but also these multiple different interpretations within different periods, like within the 20th century, there were already multiple different interpretations. Um, I don't, I don't think he's embarrassed by nakedness exactly. I'm not sure about that. Um, I mean, he seems perfectly okay with it to me. And you know, working out naked and all that. Seems, seems, I, I'm not sure that I see that in the text. Great, thank you. You are ripping through those questions. I appreciate it. Here's oh, another one. Yeah. Sure, yes, but being a man, so, so the final question be, with Nastika, he says he was embarrassed to be around her while he was naked. That, that's very different from. Um, ripping off his clothes in among the all-male at athletics contest with the Phaeacians or ripping off his clothes while he's about to slaughter the all-male um, group of guys in the in the palace, right? And, and feeling like I need to make a good impression on this obviously elite woman because otherwise I may not, you know, I, I may starve to death or I may get murdered. That's a very different thing from um, Adam and Eve, it seems, seems to me. Um, it's, it's a social embarrassment, which is different from a sense of um, you know, any internalized idea about sin. So Ulysses, the first gentleman of Europe, turning away from the naked women. <laughs> it's very funny, yes. Um, I, so I live in Philadelphia and I, I got, last week I got to go to the Rosenbach, this is, this is maybe not an answer to the question, but I'm not sure if it was a question, but the, um, in the Rosenbach they have the first ever um, edition of Ulysses and they also have manuscript of, of Ulysses in these wonderful, like, you can see Joy, how Joyce wrote on um, these cheap sheets of paper and you can see his, his very legible handwriting sloping along the page. It was really great. Um, I just, I'm happy to be in Philadelphia but I'm also happy to just know how there's this huge long tradition of Homeric perception and there are so many different ways that different people through different eras have responded to this text and I mean, from what I know about Joyce, it seems to me that um, that his his understanding of how is, how does his text relate to the Odyssey that really evolved as he went on, and it was only at a relatively late stage that he added in that map of we're going to read the, read all this narrative of this day in Dublin through the lens of this ancient text. So I think that's also a way of, sort of saying to a student, you may not know what what this is going to do for you imaginatively later in your life. Maybe there's going to be some great project and you're going to end up writing the, you know, the new modernist novel and you wouldn't realize until the halfway through, actually that's a rewrite of the Odyssey. It's really fantastic. We have just a couple of minutes left. Uh, if there are any questions, please uh, drop them into the chat box. Here's one more, last one to Sarah Miller, please. Uh, one, one question that her fresh people, her ninth grade students were interested in is how you interpret the significance of the thorn and olive bushes that have grown together, which is found at the end of book five? That's a great question. Good job, fresh people. Um, so I think the olive is always super significant whenever it occurs in the Odyssey, because of course that's the tree of Athena. And you'll remember also, I'm sure they also noticed that when Polyphemus gets his eye gouged out, it's with an olive spear. So Athena's acting behind the scenes, even when Odysseus doesn't recognize it. And he says in book 13, I did, I, you, you totally, failed on me, you left me all alone, and she says I was with you. And I think she's with him then when she's he's covered by the bushes that are both the tree of Athena and also the tree of pain, the thorn. So I think he's sort of covered by both. He, he's both going through suffering and he's also always under the wing of the aegis of the tutelary goddess. Um, uh, and then the final question is what translations do I prefer? I mean, so I guess maybe maybe this is related to the fact that I'm British. I was never made to read translations in school. I mean, I was never in a class that was um, focused on a translation. So the first time I studied it, it was in Greek. Um, I love the earlier translations. I love Chapman. And I love the way that Chapman was, a, you know, he was a dramatist. I think he brings out the multiplicity of perspectives, the voices. Um, is it connected to the active and passive translations of Polytropos? Um, so does Polytropos mean that Odysseus T is himself turning around? Is he turning many people? Is he turning many journeys? Or is he himself being turned? Um, maybe. It could be, yes. Um, I mean, I think, I think as long as you 
put Athena into your answer, then I think there are several different possible answers to what else can that that combination of trees mean. I mean, there's also that's also the passage with the great simile in which he's like the the very very distant man living out on the farmstead with the he keeps the seed of fire, which is from which um, there's a there's a great poem based on that passage. Um, so I think it's it's also about is storing up something for the future, which is which is a, another of Odysseus's great superpowers. It's both that he has this capacity for um, always finding a fix for every 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 situation, every challenge, but also of um, having a longer attention span than anybody else. He's not super quick, super truthful to the point going to be dead in five minutes like Achilles. He's very very slow. Great, thank you so much. Um, Professor, you have uh, shared an awful lot with us tonight. I will remind our audience that I've recorded tonight's session and it will be posted uh, to our attendees within a few days um, and they can take some time and linger through uh, some of the, the more complex points that you made. But in particular, uh, I think uh, we really appreciated hearing uh, about your, your, your own personal journey as a scholar and being forced to respond to certain gender accusations. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us tonight. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. I really I appreciate thank, uh, all of your questions and all your participation. Thank you. Great. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, again, it's um, it's always impressive to me that you're willing to do work after work and uh, come and join us in these these scholarly uh, discussions. Uh, you'll find again the recording, and you'll be able to match it with the pre-readings and the other materials, uh, and be able to use it hopefully in your instruction and in your class. Please uh, follow along with the National Humanities Center in our Twitter and Facebook feed, our social media, to see upcoming events and uh, opportunities. Even though our webinar series is uh, at capacity right now, other than that one session I mentioned, frequently we ask and have uh, teachers who have a conflict come up and they, uh, in a very uh, considerate way, withdraw their name and that means a, a seat uh, opens up. Libby keeps a waiting list that we automatically add folks, but you might just check back and click some links to see if there's something there as well. Our next session is scheduled for January the 30th, and we'll be talking, we're staying in Philadelphia, we'll be working with Bryant Simon, who's a professor of history at Temple, and we will be um, working with him on how to see the world, how to understand the world through the understanding of Starbucks. Please uh, join us then, and join us for a future Humanities in Class webinar series. I'm about to open the end of session poll. Once you've uh, completed that, you'll be able to download your uh, certificate. Have a great day at school tomorrow. We'll see you next time in our webinar series. Good night.